So in this problem we've got fluid flowing from a large pipe through a contraction into a smaller pipe. We're trying to figure out the pressure drop associated with the contraction just upstream and just downstream of where the two pipes are combined. Because the fluid is somewhat viscous we can't use Bernoulli's equation and because the flow isn't a very simple flow we can't simplify the Navier-Stokes equations and just integrate them. So we have to rely on experimental data. And the goal here is to figure out what dimensionless groups we could use to analyze this situation with experiments. We want to make this as efficient as possible, so to do so we're going to come up with some dimensionless groups. So here we're going to assume that you have some intuition as to what variables might affect delta p. And this assumes that you've been doing this for a number of years and you've got a, a research group to bounce ideas off of. But let's just say that you all came up with this notion that the pressure drop is going to be affected by the density, dynamic, viscosity, the inner diameter of the large pipe, inner diameter of the narrow pipe, and the average speed of the fluid through the large pipe V1. So based on these assumptions, the uh, number of pi terms that we're going to come up with will be equal to K minus R, where K is equal to 2, 3, 4, 6. We've got delta P, rho, mu, d1, d2, and v1, so 6 for k, minus the number of dimensions. So the dimensions that we need here are going to be mass, length, and time. So there's three dimensions. 6 minus 3 is equal to 3 pi terms. So to answer this question, we're going to come up with three dimensionless groups. But before we do that, you might be thinking, well, all right, if V1 affects the pressure drop, well, maybe V2 also affects the pressure drop. So why not also look at V2? If that was the case, we would have a total of four pi terms. We'd have seven variables minus three dimensions is equal to four pi terms. However, be real careful with this because V2 is dependent on V1, D1, and D2. In fact, mathematically, we could find that V2 is equal to V1, D1 squared over D2 squared. And we cannot independently vary V2 without changing V1, D1, or D2. So we can't use V2 here. So now we need to select repeating variables, and we're going to select three of them because we've got three dimensions, mass, length, and time. And we're not going to include the dependent variable. So let's not include delta p as our one of our repeating variables. So here, with that in mind, I'm going to choose d1, v1, and mu. You can choose whatever you want. You'll come up with different pi terms, but they'll be just as appropriate. In fact, if you choose something different, the pi terms that you come up with could be manipulated to form the pi terms that you would find if you chose d1, v1, and mu as the repeating variables. And this leaves us with the non-repeating variables are going to be delta p, the density, and the diameter of the narrow pipe, d2. Now let's work on the first pi term, the first non-repeating variable, delta p. We've got d1 to the a power, v1 to the b power, and mu to the c power. Delta P has units of uh, newtons per square meter, for example. This would be kilogram meters per second squared, one over meters squared, and we're left with units of kilograms per meter second squared. This means that delta P has dimensions of mass per length time squared. We've got length for d1, so length to the a. We've got length per time for velocity raised to the b power. And we've got viscosity, which has units of a pascal seconds, which is equal to a kilogram per meter second squared multiplied by seconds. So pascal seconds has units of kilogram meters seconds in the denominator. So pascal seconds, so viscosity, has dimensions of mass per length time. And this will be raised to the c power. So we want this to be dimensionless. We've got m to the 0, length to the 0, and time to the 0. If we work with the expressions for mass, we've got 1 plus c is equal to 0, and that leaves c is equal to negative 1. If we work with length, I've got negative 1 plus a plus b minus c is equal to 0. And if we work with time, we come up with negative 2 minus b b minus c is equal to 0. Making this substitution for c, we come up with b is equal to negative 1. And we'll also find that a is equal to 1. 
So with these in mind, we've got pi 1 is equal to delta p d1 raised to the a power, so that's equal to d1, v1 raised to the b power, which is uh, negative 1, and we've got mu raised to the c power, which is also equal to negative 1. So pi 1 is equal to delta p multiplied by d1 divided by v1 mu. If we check the units on this, the units on delta p are equal to kilogram meters per second squared. D1 is dimensions of meters. Second per meter is the inverse of V1. Meters second per kilograms, the dimensions of mu. So checking this, they better cancel out. We better have something that's dimensionless. We find the second squared cancel out, the kilograms cancel out, and we've got the meters canceling out. We could use a similar approach for pi 2. Pause it if you want to see the details, but we'll arrive at pi 2 is equal to d2 over d1. So the ratio of the diameters, which is equal to meters over meters, and it also is dimensionless. And thirdly, for pi 3, we use the same repeating variables, go through the same process, and we find that pi 3 is equal to rho times the diameter of the larger pi multiplied by its velocity divided by its dynamic viscosity. You might recognize this as being the Reynolds number. So based on our selection of the repeating variables, d1, v1, and mu, one of the dimensionless quantities is the Reynolds number. So the fact that the Reynolds number pops out for pi 3, it's convenient for us because oftentimes when you're doing these types of analyses you want to come up with dimensionless groups that have already been established in other problems. Now obviously you see the Reynolds number in all sorts of fluid mechanic problems so that's handy. Some other things you can do with dimensionless numbers is multiply them by other dimensionless numbers or divide them by other dimensionless numbers. So for example, I can find a new dimensionless number, pi 1 prime, and we're going to say that's equal to pi 1 multiplied by the reciprocal of pi 3. And in doing so, we find that the dynamic viscosity cancels out in this new term, as does the diameter of the large pipe. And we find that pi 1 prime is equal to delta p divided by rho v1 squared. Something you can also do is multiply these by a constant, so a dimensionless number. In this case, I'm going to multiply everything by 2. And what I find is that if I multiply everything by 2, I can put one half in the denominator to make it equivalent. In this term, you often see this one half rho v squared, you often see in Bernoulli's equation, for example. And it turns out that pi 1 prime also has a name. It's called the pressure coefficient. So pressure drop due to the constriction divided by the dynamic pressure, one half rho v1 squared. So you're often trying to get these dimensionless terms into parameters that you see elsewhere. In this instance, what you'll often see is this pi term is represented by k sub l, and it's commonly found in pipe flow problems. Another thing that we can do with dimensionless numbers is square them. For example, pi 2 prime might be equal to pi 2 squared. This will equal d2 squared over d1 squared. If I want to, I can multiply by pi over 4 in the numerator and in the denominator. I haven't changed anything. And what this represents now is a ratio of areas. The reason this is handy is you'll often find in textbooks the pi 1 double prime, which we've established is equal to kl. They'll publish kl as a function of, in our case, pi 3, which is equal to the Reynolds number. And so they'll draw experimental data. People have actually gone out to measure data points, and they find that for a particular ratio of areas, in our case, pi 2 prime, for a given value of pi 2 prime, a2 over a1, they find an experimental trend. They'll also do experiments at different values of a2 over a1. So they might run experiments like this and then uh, fit the data. And this might be a value of a2 over a1 equal to 0 0.001, for example. The first trend might be equal to 0 0.5. And if you go to these charts, you can get a value. So here, kl is going to be equal to a function of both the Reynolds number and the ratio of areas, a2 over a1. So with knowledge of the Reynolds number and knowledge of the ratio of areas, you can find one unique value for kl. And the way this would work, let's say you have a Reynolds number, you know the value of the Reynolds number, and you know the ratio of areas is equal to 0 0.01. So reading up and to the left, you'll get a value for KL. 
So a very common question is, well, what if I choose different repeating variables? It's absolutely fine. You're just going to come up with different pi terms. So in this case, we'd find by using those repeated variables, we'd find that pi 1 is equal to delta p over rho v1 squared, which we know is dimensionless. We've already looked at it. We'd find pi 2 using these repeating variables is equal to the ratio of diameters. And we'd find that pi 3, in this case, would be equal to mu over d1 v1 rho, which is equal to 1 over the Reynolds number, which, of course, is also dimensionless. So if you're taking this as a class and you want to know which repeating variables to use, the answer is it doesn't matter. However, if you wanted to have, if you were taking a test and you wanted one correct answer, the, your teacher would have to instruct you to use a particular set of repeating variables. Otherwise, there are multiple correct answers. But in practice, you're always trying to come up with dimensionless numbers that have already been tabulated elsewhere. Things like the Reynolds number or things like the loss coefficient or the ratio of areas, wherever you need to go to find the information you're interested in. So that's how you come up with probably the most appropriate dimensionless numbers.